Hey Fabricators, welcome back to another episode of Advancing Fabric, brought to you by Advancing Analytics, your data engineering, analytics and AI experts. And we have a very special episode for you today. Um, we have a guest on with us. We have Mark Price Mayer, who's joined us from Microsoft. Hey, Mark. Hey, Craig. You want to do a little bit of an intro? Yeah, uh, my name's Mark. I'm a product manager at Microsoft, and I work in the DW team. And I've been mostly working on uh, a secret product called Mirroring for the last like eight months. Yeah, so for anyone who hasn't caught up with our previous videos, we had an interview with Mark when we were both at Fabric February in Oslo. Um, and that was good. We were talking a little bit about mirroring. You were quite excited about where it was going. Um, and then since then, we've had FabCon in Vegas uh, that myself and Johnny were at. Um, and that was quite big for you, wasn't it? There was some announcements came out of that. Yeah, so we launched uh, mirroring into public preview. So now you can go into your uh, Fabric portal and you can mirror Snowflake, Azure SQL DB and Cosmos DB. Okay, so that's all there for people to play with um, and get started with. Um, what do they need to do to get started though? Is that just there by default? Can people see that already? Yeah, well, it has to be enabled. So let me just jump over to my screen, that's okay. Yeah. Tell us about some of these uh, announcements. So first of all, I just want to highlight Charles's blog. So this tells you all about mirroring and what we're doing. So, you know, that is just a shameless plug. So sorry about that. That's what you've <laughs> got to do. Um, and it does have the links on how to get started and everything down at the bottom. So, you know, uh, it's a really useful page to be on. But if you want to get going and starting with mirroring, um, this documentation kind of talks you through it so we have got like what is mirroring we've also got walkthroughs for each a mirror so for each mirror oh, okay. db, nice. sort of for, yeah for azure sql for for cosmos db for snowflake so we have the um uh what we call the tutorial so that talks you through step by step of how to get it how to to do it but if you don't see the um the the items in fabric mm -hmm. um, it needs to be enabled on your tenant so we, we actually go okay. into if we go into snowflake because i love snowflake um you actually see it's <laughs> one of the top things to do um okay we're going to tutorial so okay so that's your that's your initial steps is enabling that yeah yeah so so you simply just go into the admin portal. So go into, so if you are the admin, you can do this. If you are not the admin, you need to buy the admin some donuts or whatever they like. Um, <laughs> but all they need to do is come in here into the admin portal. You'll see that mirroring here is there. And then they can just enable it for specific users. So if, yeah. if not everyone in your organization needs it, they can just unlock it for you or a small group of people. And it's as simple as that. Within 15, 20 minutes, it should just appear in the in the user interface. So, and you'll see it like, let's go and create a work, well, let's go and create a workspace and I can show you what it looks like. So let's go to workspaces. Wow, create a Brilliant, new one. Yeah. We'll just call this AA. Okay, so people can just basically, once that's enabled, they'll start to see um, different options in here. Yeah, so you go into new, and yeah, we've got those new items showing under data warehousing, nice. So now you've seen um, where the icons are, let's let's go and have a chat about why we think mirroring is important for, for, for us as Microsoft, but for also for our customers. Great, sounds good. Yeah, tell us a little bit about it if folk have not seen the announcement. Yeah. yeah, so mirroring, in essence, is something really simple. We take data that's sitting in those sources, the Cosmos, um, Azure SQL DB, oh, so Cosmos DB, the, the team will tell me off. Azure Cosmos DB, Snow, um, Snowflake, and Azure SQL DB, and we turn it into Delta, and we keep it in sync using CDC, using the CDC from mm -hmm. the source system. So any changes in the source system in, in, in Snowflake, rows being inserted, updated, deleted, um, tables being dropped, tables being created, columns yeah. being added, 
are all then replicated in near real time over into one lake, which can then be queried using SQL, T-SQL, be queried using Spark. You can create shortcuts to it. You can create Power BI reports. It's V-ordered. Everything that you can do in Fabric today on top of Delta, you can do with that mirrored data. Okay. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, so one of the questions I have to ask, though, um, and I guess there's two different ways to put this, is what's stopping people from importing all their databases into Fabric, just basically saying, mirroring is brilliant, I'm going to bring everything in? Or I guess the in inverse of that question is, what kind of scenarios do you see this being most valuable to people? Okay, so first of all, please don't bring all your data across. I mean, we love having the <laughs> data, but only bring the data that you need across. So where we yeah. are seeing, and the, the real kind of use case that one of the reasons this was built is that people are using Power BI reports and the data that they're importing from and using from Snowflake, SQLDB and the analyst, uh, and analytics they're doing on Cosmos, the data is just getting bigger and bigger. And it takes yeah. longer to do the imports. And as the queries and the reports get more complicated, you know, direct query will slow down. So yeah. the challenge is that we want to have more data and we want it to be faster, but we have, we've still got the laws of physics in the way. <laughs> so where mirroring comes in really useful is that we, we will replicate that data from the source system and it sits in one lake. So now it sits much closer to the reports. Yeah. Um, you're not having to do imports, which take time, you know, which, you know, imports can take hours and hours and hours. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you're doing direct query, you're not having to wait several minutes for that report, you know, to, to refresh and all the visuals to update. It's all happening locally in one lake. Um, so reports that, you know, you would take, you have to wait for whatever time in the morning to be ready will now instantly be ready because we're moving that data across um using cdc so we're just moving the deltas so before you might import yeah. several tables and have to refresh them constantly during the day now we're doing that in the background and yeah so one of the yeah so you're bringing that um a little bit more of that kind of complex kind of etl or elt process um and just making that a lot simpler for people to use so where you might have to kind of build something custom to kind of to to do that delta and bring over only what's changed from those source databases you're kind of making that e of that process the extract component just a lot simpler for people yeah i mean it is it's a really it's a, a zero we're calling it a zero etl near real-time tool uh, it is it's doing the el for you um now we aren't allowing any t the transformation uh, because that yeah, adds yeah. at the moment because that adds complexity and we've just we've just gone into public preview so we are taking a lot of feedback from customers who are saying we want to do a little bit of transformation and we're just working through that feedback at the moment and seeing what we can put in and what's practical one of the cool features that i wanted one of the cool features that i wanted to mention is the cost. I don't know whether you want to mention this later, but now, but I'm going to bring it up now, is that um, Microsoft is, is absorbing the cost of the uh, of, it, of the transfer of data, or of the compute. So the amount of compute it takes to move that data. Okay. Um, and we are giving some storage away for free. So you won't is have that... to pay for moving that data across. Yeah, so the, the storage component, that's quite closely linked to your fabric capacity, isn't it? So specific capacities will have a certain amount of storage available. And as you move up the capacities, your available storage increases as well, isn't it? But it's already, it already starts quite high, doesn't it? Is it like two terabytes for, a, is it an F2 or something? Yes. So the, the smallest amount we give away for free is two terabytes, which is a significant amount of, of storage to give yeah. away. So we don't, and the rationale is we didn't want to penalize people for, for having to move. So mirroring does make it, so it's another point perhaps. Mirroring is a copy of that data. 
So yeah. unlike shortcuts, which are just pointers to data, mirroring is a, a copy. So we physically, a one terabyte database, if you mirror the entire thing, it's one terabyte. We're, move, we, you know, we're moving and you're using that storage. So no, A, just move sure. the data you need, just the tables you want, your goal layer. You don't need to move the rest. Um, and we're yeah. not going to penalize you for having moved that data across. We want you to utilize it. But yeah. we yeah. still love those sort of systems. We still love Snowflake. <laughs> okay, so enough chatting about it. Can you show us a little bit what that looks like? Yeah, so let's jump across to my screen again. Cool. So we're just carrying on where we left off. So we've got uh, the AA demo workspace. So I'm going to create a Snowflake mirror. And the process is the same for pretty much all mirrors. Yeah, so it's the same kind of thing that you're doing, whether it's Azure SQL DB or Snowflake or Cosmos DB or all of the ones that are coming after that that you can totally tell us about. <laughs> uh, not not today, but, but nicely done <laughs> while I was distracted. So I'm just giving it <laughs> a name. <laughs> it's almost like hot ones that you're distracting yep. me by me doing a demo and then and then I'll give you I'll, some sneak, secrets will sneak out. Cool. So I'm just okay. going to click Snowflake database. I need to put in the name of my Snowflake server. So that lets you set up a new connection. Yes. So let's just go in and just so you know that we don't care where Snowflake is. So it doesn't <laughs> matter which cloud it's running in. It's running in Azure, running in AWS, running in GCP. Um, and now I put in the warehouse. Now, for all the Microsoft people, this catches everyone out. This is not the database. We ask for the database later. This is the Snowflake warehouse or the Snowflake compute. This is very, okay. very different. So I just want you to be completely aware of that. Um, that caught me out and that catches lots of people out. <laughs> so I'm just going to put in a name. We'll give it a new connection name. Uh, um, it's a case of people going rogue on naming conventions. Know. Like, don't get me started on lake houses and fabric not actually being a lake house. It's more like a lake room, but that's that's a rant for another day. So this is the place we can now enter in the database. So I just select it from my drop-down list, and I'm going to pick the AA demo. And then I can hit connect. And that is all I need to do. I've just given it a server name, a warehouse name, some login credentials, and a database name. And that's it. Yeah. I can just hit mirror database, and everything is done. All the tables, and I'm going to be very specific tables, internal tables, the snowflake will just get moved across. Now I can also go and select them. So I can click on there and it will now bring up a list of tables in that database and I can select specific ones. Now this is, if you're doing this as a demo and you're setting this up, this is how you would do it. You wouldn't just mirror the entire database um, unless it's very yeah, small or just a sample. Yeah, you'd select what you were doing and you would bring it over. Like I've played about with this with the Azure SQL option and yeah, you can go in and you can pick specific tables. Um, is there any kind of restrictions here that might block us? Like any kind of uh, data types and things like that that might not be supported or scenarios where people might have difficulty bringing things over? So from on Snowflake, we are pretty good. So we support pretty much everything. Um, we don't support external tables, temporary tables, transient tables, or dynamic tables. Okay. Or views. And that's probably the sticky point. Views is because lots of people use views. Yeah. Um, so all I need to do is just click on mirror database. And that's it. Now, in the background, What's happening is it's going off to Snowflake and it's saying create a, so we can actually go and look at Snowflake. You can look at the 
the query history in Snowflake and see the exact queries we're running. Okay. So it will yeah. run a copy into to create a snapshot of the table. And then it will create a stream on that table, on every table that I'm mirroring to then, so we can see, and we can actually get a high watermark of, of all the changes and all the versions that are happening in Snowflake. And that is it. As soon as it's finished, I can go through, I can monitor replication. Um, so we can see how far it's got through. It normally takes a few minutes before things start kicking into life. Yeah. Um, I can go in, I can configure the replication so I can change which tables have been coming in, coming out. I can stop the replication, I can restart it. So, but stopping, just, just so people are aware, stopping and restarting will effectively break the replication and start it again from scratch scratch it isn't like a pause so if oh, you have okay. got some large okay. tables it will recede effectively recede them and it's as simple as that so you mentioned that um, microsoft are absorbing the cost for the the compute there uh, for this for kind of bringing that over um is that something that's part of the preview is that something that's likely to change when when it goes ga or is that a bit of an unknown at the moment no, so that that's how it's going to be. Um, we would have just okay. said that was a, the preview cost. So yeah. we just want to be very clear that this would be the same cost we are absorbing as if you were running an ADF package or you right. were running um, some sort of import. There is a cost on, for example, in this case, there's a cost on Snowflake. So we are running some extra queries on Snowflake um, so we can... Yeah set the mirroring up so we can check for changes and move those changes across now yeah yeah so the, thinking about the original um azure data factory so if we were bringing something over and we were using azure data factory to do that um extract and load you've got an integration runtime that's going to have a cost associated with it that's running in the background so yeah like doing it this way that that cost is kind of abstracted away it's it's, it's taken away um, is that happening on your fabric compute? So if I pause my fabric capacity, does that stop the replication or is it completely separate to the capacity? So it is, it's, it's separate to the capacity as in you're not being billed for it. But if you do pause your capacity, it will effectively pause replication that's going on. Okay. Okay. Not break it, just pause it though. Yes. Yeah. So it will just won't be running, but so it will just pick up from where it left off. Oh, okay. But okay. Th there is a little nuance that depending on the source system, each source system holds the changes for a certain number of days. So there is a default right. for Snowflake. So if you went over the, I think it's seven or fourteen days for Snowflake, we would have to reseed to because we couldn't pick up from where it last yeah. left off. Yeah, but w which is fair, and it's something that people should definitely consider where. Um, there's different kind of scenarios where we want to pause capacities or if we want capacities that are running 24 seven. So it's just something to kind of consider if you're adopting mirroring, then you need to kind of be aware that if someone turns this off and goes off on two weeks holiday, then we're going to potentially have a problem and have to reseed everything. Yes. Where I have seen an interesting challenge is that someone wanted to see how much the compute actually costs. So they span up an extra compute just for mirroring. Um, ah, okay. All their changes were happening. They were having changes every second. So even though the compute was set to auto pause, it stayed up. Yeah. Because we were constantly pulling the changes across. So effectively, they ended up paying for some compute they didn't really need. <laughs> they should have just used yeah. the compute that was always existing and always running. But they wanted to do it as a bit of a test. Um, but so. If your changes are very small and you're not very making very many changes, then then it may be worth doing that, running on a separate capacity or doing something else. Fabric, uh, if it, an extra compute in in Snowflake, but if you are constantly changing that data, you're just going to pay for another compute to be, you know, another warehouse to be running, and it's just not worth the the cost. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. The the, the aim is. That we are going to remove the so the, the 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 benefit is that now that data is sitting now in Fabric, I can now query it in Fabric without having to put any extra load on top of Snowflake. So Snowflake should yeah. run better, 
all the Power BI queries are running. Now, if you're not using Power BI and using some other tools, then you, know, you will have a different experience. So just this is really optimized yep. for Power BI because we'd be ordering the data. So just I just want to make that clear that you know your mileage may vary depending on your usage <laughs> of Snowflake and how you're querying it. Yeah, yeah, and I mean like talking about architectures and how we would approach those kind of things like that's something that I see quite often where we want to bring a copy of the data over and we want it um, we want to kind of keep that as a little bit of a single source of truth so that we don't need to go back and put that burden on the operational system um, whether that's a SQL database or Snowflake or something else so having this option mirroring as a, a way to do that um, that's a little bit simpler and easier then it, it kind of fills that uh, gap and kind of ticks that box in terms of um, a kind of best practices approach. So while we were, do you want to just jump back to my screen? So while we were talking, it's actually finished the replication. So I just wanted to, to show you what it looks like. So once it's done, I can hit monitor replication. And, yeah. And so we can see all these rows have come across and these are all the tables. Um, we can see this is the number of rows this is effectively is the changes uh, mm -hmm. but now that's just come across i can now go into my sql analytics endpoint that data the, that snowflake data is now in one lake it's now delta so here it is okay oh okay yeah and this takes a couple of seconds because it's just going to warm up um yeah i can click on properties here and it will tell me the storage location that that delta table is on. Now I can use One Lake Explorer. Um, yep. I, you know, to, to view the the delta table, I can use um, the ABSF path directly from here. I can run now Spark directly on the top, or I can create a lake house, create a shortcut to this location, and 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 then just use it just natively. So yeah, so we're seeing that as so any other delta table. Because it is any other Delta table. Um, yeah. There's a little bit of a secret that the, the SQL Analytics endpoint doesn't know that this is a mirrored database. Um, yeah. It just says, well, there's some Delta tables. I'm going to show them to you. Great. Well, thanks a lot for the demo, Mark. That's, that's kind of demonstrated how easy that is and how kind of simple it is. And um, just like we'd seen with shortcuts in the past where like, once they're kind of brought in, they just show as kind of native um, tables that are in there. And with mirroring, you've got these um, delta tables that are in there as well. And we're not seeing that all of the kind of work that's kind of went into getting them there in the background. Um, and it all just kind of comes together. It's pretty interesting. What did you call it? A lake? You didn't call it a lake house. You called it a lake. A lake room. What was your name? Lake room. Okay, we'll call it an AA lake room. <laughs> and I just, just wanted to, to prove the point. Um, now, what I will also mention, and so so we have customers using this today, um, and we're getting lots yeah. of feedback on it. Um, so hence the reason why I know that the warehouse sort of is, is a little bit of an issue. I just wanted to also mention that if you are doing Azure SQL DB mirroring, there's a couple of gotchas that seem to be catching a lot of people out. So here's our, okay. um, our mirror database is highlighted as mirrored. And then I can just pull whichever tables I want across. And it's that simple. So I could now bring that data in. I can then, you know, create shortcuts, other sets of data, create you know, shortcuts in my warehouse. I can do cross database yeah. queries. Just everything that I can do, you know, you know, I can just do on top of it in here. So can I just point out the um, the thing that catches some people out in Azure SQL DB before we go? Yeah, yeah, that would be great. All right. So in the yeah, some... Azure SQL DB tutorial, sorry.
So this is if you're using mirroring from an Azure SQL DB rather than Snowflake? Yeah, there's a couple of little things you need to do. Obviously, turn on mirroring of the fabric, uh, the tenant level, but yep. you need to go into um, the Power BI um, tenant settings again and allow service principles user in Power BI. So this is something, so you need to go in and turn this on. So this is something that people okay. forget about. And the reason we need to do this is because Azure SQL DB mirroring is slightly different and the user search model uses a push model. So that's one of the things we need to do. And, and the reason why we need to do that is because the, the logical SQL server in Azure, mm -hmm. we have to actually um, give it a system managed identity. So it's, okay. it's, it's just in the, the identity settings and security. You just, it's just a tick box. So don't be scared of this. It sounds complicated. It isn't. It just gives that SQL server uh, effectively an identity that it can run on. And then it uses that identity to then push the changes that are happening in Azure SQL DB into fabric. And that's why mm. you need this setting and the allow service principles um, to be turned on. Um, so we've noticed a couple of uh, customers sort of falling down on those points. Um, yeah, yeah. So once they're done, you should not have a problem setting up SQL DB mirroring. Okay, great. Yeah, that's some great advice and something that is, yeah, obviously you're you're seeing these kind of scenarios coming up in the preview. That these are the kind of things that you're you're seeing customers experiencing. Um, is there any, so? Tell me, what does the future look like for mirroring then? What's the the kind of roadmap ahead? So I'm going to be very vague. Um, I'm going to, so obviously we want to GA with this, with the sources that we have. We have a number of very exciting sources coming. And we also have some super secret features that are coming, which um, okay. I'm not allowed to talk about. Um, <laughs> I don't even think we've told the MVPs about it. But yes, That's there's fair. a lot of new new things coming in mirroring. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Um, thanks again for joining us, Mark. Um, and thanks for kind of taking the time to to run us through that demo of Snowflake. Um, and yeah, like like you said, documentation is king here. Run through that tutorial. Um, it's fairly easy to get started. And um, once you've got those kind of configuration settings with Azure SQL, um, and I've been playing about with it myself, so it's it's something that's um, definitely really interesting. And I can see a lot of use cases, but don't rep don't replicate everything over or every database. <laughs> no, no, please don't. We do actually have a 500 table limit that we're not shouting about, but um, and that's to stop okay. people doing that kind of thing and accidentally mirroring yeah. you know, massive amount of volume of data. So um, yeah, yeah, we, we do and have that's a fair. Little, uh, got to in there. Yeah, so you should you should be restricting what you want to bring over anyway. That should be happening much further up the chain. Um, I mean, kind of standard practice, right? You don't want to bring down absolutely everything. It's been a kind of best practice for a long time. Just just just, just process what you need to process. If you over process, then somebody is paying for you know in time <laughs> and, and money for that extra work. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thanks again. And uh, if you're new here, then please like and subscribe. Uh, and we'll see you again soon for another uh, episode of Advancing Fabric.